you can never overachieve your self-image. And so you got to start with your self-image and your self-image is created by your skills, your knowledge, and your desire. It's created by your what. Then you can ask for who. Who can help me with what I want and who can I help with what I want? See, the fastest way to get to where you want to be is ask someone that's already there for directions. It's very true. And statistically, to be successful, the fastest way to accelerate that is to help other people get to where they want to be. Hey, everybody, and welcome to a cold episode of the Slow Smoke Business Show. So I am outside in the 40 degree weather. I think it's 40, 35, something like that here. And we're going to be grilling some hanger steak today. So pretty basic concept. We're going to throw this on the grill, uh, kind of go slow. So it's almost like a small strip of brisket or something like that. You're going to kind of treat it the same way. I've seasoned it the same way. And I'm really excited about our guest today. So while we're putting this on the grill, uh, and I'm going to spray it a little bit. So we've got a, a non-stick situation going here. So our guest today, I got to tell you, I'm pretty pumped. This is, um, you know, we have lots of really interesting people on this show, but today's guest is a guy named David Meltzer. And if you're not familiar with David Meltzer, David is a lot of things. He is a, you know, certainly an author and a speaker and everything else. But the reason that people want to hear from him He's lived an extraordinary life. This is an entrepreneur who had a massive billion dollar exit in the 90s. This is a guy who got into the sports agency industry and part of his career and his life was the inspiration for the movie Jerry Maguire with Tom Cruise. He built up an incredible fortune, lived a fast life, experienced a mindset shift that helped him get through losing it all and then building it back up again this time with the with the goal of helping over a billion people become happy. So I can't tell you how excited I am to have this guest on today and let's dive into it. I just take a couple minutes, you know, I like to introduce myself by talking about a journey through three worlds. I was born into a world of not enough, single mom, six kids, she worked two jobs, packed my dinner in a paper bag so she could teach second grade and fill up turnstiles at convenience stores with greeting cards. And I just wanted to be rich so I could buy my mom a house and a car. Graduated law school, entered a new world of just enough, a world where everybody was buying things they don't need to impress people they didn't like. Uh, Became a millionaire nine months out of law school, not because I became a lawyer, even though my mom made me take the bar and become a real lawyer. I got involved in the internet in 1992 and by 1993, I was a millionaire. By 95, we exited for $3.4 billion to Thomson Reuters. I then continued on that journey of scarcity. I call it scarcity, even though it was a world for me. Everything was a trade or a negotiation in my life. And that ended uh, abruptly when I was running Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment, the most notable sports agency in the world. I moved from technology. Lee was looking for a CEO that could apply a technology background, technology relationships to sports. He saw the future of sports in technology. He was a visionary, as everyone knows. They made the movie Jerry Maguire about him for a reason. And uh, I abruptly changed my life uh, when I realized that not only was I a multimillionaire, not only was I married to my dream girl, but I had access to things that even billionaires could afford. And I realized at that time I wasn't happy. And my wife woke me up, told me to take stock in who I was, what I wanted to become. And two years before I lost everything, over $100 million, I started a transformational journey uh, to live in a world of more than enough, a world of more than enough of everything, a faith-based world, of a world of infinite opportunities, options, touches of favor that's guided by a source, whatever you call it, philosophically or religiously or spiritually, whatever you call it, a source that was bigger than me, that loved me more than my mom. And that faithful journey over the last 16 years had led me to a mission to empower over a billion people to be happy, to teach them what I've learned, to make a lot of money, to live in abundance, to help a lot of people, to live in philanthropy, and to have a lot of fun, to live happily. And so my journey was one of 
Not enough as a victim, just enough as a scarce, money-driven, more than enough now in an infinite, abundant world of helping other people get what they want and allowing money to follow me. And it has and it continues to uh, amaze me that this is the best journey and the best way to go about it. Yeah, we could dive into like a, a four-part episode of all the things you just talked about, but I wanted to dive into one thing in particular, and that was the mindset shift you talked about. And I noticed that it happened, thankfully, probably for you, it happened before you sort of had a, had a dip in your career that you had to, to dig back out of. So tell me a little more about how that mind shift changed the way you saw the world and how it helped you get through something that ultimately was temporary, but, but probably at the time didn't feel that way. Yeah, it was a mindset, heart set, and handset shift. And it was, uh, the catalyst was my wife. I'd come home at 5.30 in the morning after lying to her. I went to a concert, uh, a Grammy Awards actually, with Little John the Rapper. And I told her I had a business meeting. She had told me I shouldn't go. And uh, I ended up coming home and she basically said that uh, she was scared for my life, that she thought that I better take stock in who I was and what I wanted to become or I'd end up dead. And I had three daughters under 10 at the time, married to my dream girl from the fourth grade, uh, who we got married far later. She hated me when I was young because I was the first boy to ask her to go study at sixth grade camp and the last <laughs> one to ask her to go study as we've been married 25 years. Um, it took me a night because I woke up the, the next morning and I was full of anger. I hated my wife. I hated my best friends. I hated my dad, my mom. And it was really interesting as I sat there hating everybody, blaming everybody, justifying you know, my success, uh, monetary success, and justifying my unhappiness, the lack of fulfillment, passion, and purpose in my life. It made it worse that everybody, I, I, uh, I was with Ricky Williams, the running back, and he said, Dave, you were living a glamorized stuck. It's the worst type of being stuck when everyone's glamorized where you are, but yet you know you're stuck. And everybody wants to be Jerry Maguire. Everybody wants to be rich. Everybody wants to have a great family. And yet you feel stuck. And it makes it way worse uh, that everybody dreams of having a life like yours and you're miserable. Well, I sat there on my bed hating everyone and everything. And it was interesting because I looked over in my closet. And years before, my dad, for my 30th birthday, had given me a jacket. This is when I separated from my father because I told him I hated him because he gave me a jacket on my 30th birthday to teach me a lesson. He gave me a jacket with no pockets. And it was the first present he had given me in 20 years. Wow. He had forgotten my birthday at 10. We had all types of problems in my life. And I was so excited to get the jacket. And when I realized that he was trying to teach me that money doesn't buy love or happiness, he actually said to me, David, you're just like me. I got, I'm worried about you. Hang this, this jacket's not for wearing. Hang it in the closet. Remind yourself, you can't take anything with you when you're gone. Be buried in this jacket, David. Please listen to me. And I told my dad at the time, I'm nothing like you. You're a liar, a cheater, a manipulator, overseller, backend seller. I hate you. I never want to even talk to you again. <laughs> it ended up, that jacket was the greatest gift I've ever gotten. Wow. Because I looked over at that jacket when I was, full of hate. And I realized one thing, I don't hate my wife. I don't hate my friends. I don't hate my mom. And I certainly didn't hate my dad. I hated myself. I was a liar, a cheater, a manipulator, an overseller and a back end seller. And I had to take stock in who I was. And that day I found who I was, the boy that made his mom proud, not the one that if she knew what I was doing and who I was doing it with, she wouldn't have been proud. And uh, from that day, I decided I would practice gratitude. I would practice forgiveness. I would practice accountability. I would practice a effective communication, not just with others, but with source. No longer would I try to get more happy, more healthy, more wealthy, and more worthy. Instead, I would work on I am. I am happy, I am healthy, I am wealthy, I am worthy. What am I doing to interfere with it? And that paradigm shift, that mindset, heart set, and handset shift 
guided me through losing over $100 million, guided me through not only telling my mom I was bankrupt. The only reason I wanted to be rich was to buy her the house in the car. I lost the house in the car for her. Wow. I didn't take my name off it. Oh. But it guided me through this to 16 years later to have more money, help more people, and have more fun to be passionate, purposeful, and profitable in everything I do because I have taken stock and I've created practices, daily practices of gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, and effective communication. So you mentioned you've got daily practices and that's amazing. I, I, we're coming up on the end of the year. Is there anything that you do say periodically or quarterly or once a year where you sort of rake a lot of your thoughts together and think about the year ahead. I know some people are, you know, it's funny, human nature, right? As the calendar changes into a new year, we all start taking stock of who we are and what are we going to do? And we make resolutions. I think resolutions are silly uh, because they're, they're fleeting, right? But um, I do like taking stock of who you are. Do you have a tactical thing that you revisit? I see you, I, you do the daily thing, which I think is amazing. Is there another step that you take periodically to think about where you're going in life? So the only periodic step I take, because I do have, and I'm very disciplined in knowing my what in a trajectory of where I think I want to be every day, know my who, who I can help and who can help me in that trajectory, know my how for today in that trajectory and prioritize accordingly what's important to me, not what's important to other people or what's missing or what I don't have. This allows me to apply my why to identify what I'm doing to interfere with I am. But the only thing I do periodically, and I do this every quarter, is I uh, take a staycation with my wife. We have four children. I've been married uh, for 25 years. And so every quarter we go spend one night, usually it's a Friday night. Uh, and what we do is uh, go in the afternoon and we sit in separate rooms and we write out what we want for the next quarter and the next year separately. Then we go to dinner, we have a romantic evening, then we wake up, we have breakfast, and we go back again for an hour, and we revisit the list that we made the night before, giving it a little bit more clarity, a little bit more focus. Then we go ahead and have lunch, and then after lunch, we get together and we go through those lists of what we want, and we prioritize accordingly by reconciling both lists together about what we want individually and then coordinate together what we want as a family. And that's the only uh, practice that I have that has any attachment uh, to a trajectory. And the only reason I have to do that every quarter is because I can do my own daily practices every day, but when I coordinate the most important person in my life with me, I have to have it within a time frame that is outside of a daily practice. I think you're downplaying that. That's an extraordinary practice. And um, I think people forget that the people around you and most importantly, your spouse um, can hold you back or lift you up and, and help you be more successful. And if you, I mean, I, you know, not taking things out of context of what your story, but Clearly, some of the stories that you said at the beginning of the conversation, you and your spouse are not on the same page, right? And this is a great way, that's a great way to make sure that you are on the same page. Because at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's such a cliche. You get, you work really hard, you come from a tough upbringing, you work your butt off and you get somewhere and you achieve some things. And then, you know, you look around and you go, well, where's the happiness, right? Like what, isn't this what was supposed to be? And then you realize that it's the relationships. You mentioned that earlier. It's the relationships. It's the, the people around you, not the things. It's the experiences and the relationships and the inward focus and the thoughts about your value that really drive whether or not you're happy. And I love that you're saying your goal is, you know, a bill. Is it at one point? What is it? A over, over 1 billion people I'm going to empower in my lifetime. That's incredible. Well, uh, you know, hopefully we can, I know my mom listens to this podcast, so it'll be two after this recording, right? So yeah, that's all I need. I appreciate that. So as we go to the end of the year and everybody's, you know, going to get ready to jog off that extra 10 pounds and whatever it is, and they're trying to think about what they want to do with their life. What would you say to somebody who's trying to make a change in their life and they need a mindset shift? What are the tactical things that they can do to start that process? Number one, is to know your what every day 
in a trajectory of what you think you want in the future and look backwards at the meaning that you give the defining moments and inflection points that are also in that trajectory. Meaning, for example, I went bankrupt. I lost over a hundred million dollars. When I had to go tell my mom that I went bankrupt and lost her house, uh, I gave it a meaning and it wasn't one in the trajectory of where I wanted to be. It was one of being a failure. It was one of, you know, shame. It was one of guilt. It was one of offense and justification. I shifted the meaning of my past to align with what I want today, according to the trajectory of that empowering over a billion people in the future. You see, you can never overachieve your self-image. And so you got to start with your self-image and your self-image is created by your skills, your knowledge, and your desire. It's created by your what. Then you can ask for who. Who can help me with what I want and who can I help with what I want? See, the fastest way to get to where you want to be is ask someone that's already there for directions. <laughs> it's very true. And yeah. statistically, to be successful, the fastest way to accelerate that is to f- help other people get to where they want to be. By doing so, you create a community of sponsors and power sponsor. You create a community and a consciousness of people who are trying to help one another and people who know people that can help one another. You see, the statistical success and momentum, the acceleration that occurs by asking for help and offering help is an extraordinary exponential factor in life that most people don't take advantage of. And if they do, they only take advantage of helping others. They don't see the value and humility in asking for help. And when we ask others for help, there's nothing that will make that other person, there's nothing that will add more value to somebody's life than asking them for help. We feel so important. We feel so powerful when somebody asks us for help, yet we deny that power. We deny that light. We deny those lessons by asking other people. People ask me all the time, what would you tell that 18-year-old Dave, that arrogant young man who thought he could change the world and be rich and buy his mama a house in a car? I'll tell you what I tell 18-year-old Dave, 28-year-old Dave, 38-year-old Dave, 48-year-old Dave, and I'm 54 right now, I'll even tell 58-year-old day four years from now, <laughs> three words, and everybody get your pens out, get your pads out, get your phones out. Ask for help. Radical humility, allowing the power of source. You are an incredible resource when you ask for help. You become, you can't give what you don't have. The fastest way to get to where you want to be is to ask for help and then help other people with what you've learned, what you've received from asking other people for help. I don't believe in influencers. I'm probably the first influencer that you've ever met because I want to stay in the flow of giving and receiving and being of service and value to all and asking for service and value as well. Dave, you are such a gift. I'm so I'm so thrilled to have you here and sharing your story with our audience. And we appreciate you so much. If somebody wanted to connect with you and what you're working on today, where could they find you? Well, I'd like to offer all your audience, by the way, my book, my guides, my exercises. I will sign a book. I will pay for the book. I will pay for shipping. Uh, I know that I can give you the daily practices and the mindset, heart set, and hand set uh, on my mission to empower you and others to be happy. So if you can email me directly, I'd love to send the five daily practices in my book to everyone. David at dmeltzer.com. David's my first name, at D, my first initial. Meltzer is like seltzer with an M, meltzer.com, David at dmeltzer.com. And if you forget the email, reach out to Jared. That's right. And if you forget Jared, just Google me. You will find me, David Meltzer. I'm blessed to be everywhere. I think uh, most people who know me would agree. When you when you become aware of David Meltzer, he seems to appear everywhere. <laughs> I love it. Well, David, you're, you're, it was a treat having you here on the podcast, and hopefully we can dive into some barbecue soon together. I would love that, man. Anytime I love barbecue, I'll come back on the show, Jared. Thank you for respecting my time. Thank you for sharing your audience. And remember, everyone, be more interested than interesting. Be kind to your future self. Do good deeds. We'll see you later. <laughs>